All right, so Dune is finally out on Blu-ray and uh, home streaming. So if you missed it in theaters, now's your chance to finally see it on the smallest screen possible with the worst sound possible. But in all seriousness, the film is so great, there's no doubt in my mind that it's gonna hold up just as well on home video. To celebrate the release of the film, here's part two of my review. In my last review, I said that Dune wasn't as good as I had hoped. I want to clarify that statement. What I meant was that my vision of Dune, the one that I had reading the book, was bigger than this film. Villeneuve himself has acknowledged that a film ends up much smaller than a book, because a film is limited by what's possible to put on screen and what has to be cut in order to weave together a coherent narrative. I had to change things in order to make it uh, cinematic. To adapt this to destroy it, it's a process that is quite violent to go from a book to, to uh, uh, the screen. A book can take its time, letting you live alongside its characters at the pace of life. While a film has to fit within a 90 to 180 minute runtime and is bound by the limits of special effects and budget. I think a very typical cinematic thing is economy. A book has no limitations to its budget. Large special effects are as cheap as putting words on a page. A book's limitations are only the imagination of its reader as it greets the imagination of its author. Reading is, very literally, a direct synthesis that we experience with the mind of another person. And the experience that I had with Frank Herbert was something that can only be described as transcendent. It transcended literature and created something greater, something that leapt from Herbert's brain to mine and had a tangible impact on my life. It taught me the power of mind over reality. The importance of examining our biases and understanding that choices made on instinct are not, in fact, choices at all, and showed the depths available to those who choose to delve into their own mind. This film didn't have that same effect, and that was what I expected going in. Reading some of the reviews that came out of the Venice Film Festival following the film's premiere, I was expecting something akin to an epic adventure like Lord of the Rings, if it were merged with the metaphysics of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Many films have provided this experience for me in the past. Tapped into that sense of cosmic mystery, and stuck with me long after the experience ended. Many of you have likely seen 2001, and if you haven't, I wholly recommend starting there. But Stanley Kubrick's magnum opus is just the tip of an iceberg of cinema that reaches out of the screen and reminds you of your own spiritual existence. I was expecting Dune to be in this caliber of filmmaking. And the simple truth is that it just wasn't. But there's still time for it to become that. In this second review of Dune, I'm going to highlight what I felt was missing what the book succeeds in providing its readers that the movie adaptation doesn't, and examine a few of the foundational principles of Dune as it was envisioned by Frank Herbert that need to make their way into the sequels if the series is going to at least approach the greatness of what Herbert set down in writing. This video is going to assume some foundational knowledge of the Dune series, pulling out important details for you longtime fans. What I can safely say after five viewings is that Dune is, without a doubt, one of the best science fiction adventure films in existence. It far surpasses Star Wars in creating a grounded, tangible world you feel you can step into. The stakes are higher, and it provides such an intense emotional roller coaster, taking you faster and faster through one strange sight after another. But in watching through the movie, I was stunned to see that a hugely important detail was omitted from the script. And that is the Butlerian Jihad. Dune is, as I explained in my World Showcase video, a post-technological universe. Everything present in the world of Dune is born out of a fictional holocaust that occurred in which man was subverted by machines. Not just in a physical sense, but a psychological one as well. There was a great war, in which man overthrew the shackles imposed by their own mechanical creations. But there was also a great revolution, a revolution of thought. Mankind learned that progress for the sake of progress was not enough, that forward movement was actually an illusion, pulling us from greatness as it hit its decay under shiny new inventions and devices to make our lives easier. 
There has been much talk in interviews about the analog nature of technology in the Dune universe, so it's clearly something that the creators understood. The world is analog, and the thing that I deeply love, the idea that we are dealing here with a science fiction world where there is no computers, and where the only intelligence on board is the human brain. But with no mention whatsoever of the Machine Crusade, the meaning of this aesthetic choice is completely lost. We can see the Atreides and Harkonnen warriors fighting with swords and anachronistic technology, but without understanding the reason humanity made this decision, it comes across as a hollow and confusing stylistic choice. Many of the signature factions that emerged out of the Butlerian Jihad, when mankind learned to replace computers with human minds trained to access the unique depths of their own psychology, are really underplayed. It's been said elsewhere, but the Mentats and Guild don't get much love in this film. Denis has said he's going to explore the Mentats much more in part two, so I'm taking him at his word for that. And of course, the Guild didn't get much service in the books until the second novel, Dune Messiah, so their absence in this film is still on track for how Herbert chose to tell his story. One thing about the Guild that has been changed, however, is the way space travel functions. With the amount of time I dedicated to the Holtzman effect in my World Showcase video, it's clear that this is a part of the world I really love. Namely, how one discovery ripples outwards to affect society in so many different ways. Previous adaptations have been, shall we say, lackluster in their portrayal of this reality-warping technology. And this film is, unfortunately, no different. Highliners are no longer great vessels that carry thousands of ships to their destinations but bridges that allow instantaneous travel simply by flying through the portal they create from one part of the universe to another. The navigators are still mentioned as part of this process, but as the Highliners no longer move through space, it's unclear how the navigators are involved in this rendition of Dune. One thing I really did like is that instead of talking about houses and politics and aristocracy, the dialogue is altered slightly so that characters make direct conversation about wealth. 80 years of owning the spice fields. Can you imagine the wealth? The Hawkins were taking 10 billion solaris out of here every year. Making the class of the characters in the film highly apparent. By controlling spice production, they became obscenely rich. Richer than the Emperor himself. At a time when the wealth gap has become increasingly consequential for the daily lives of so many of us, I think it was useful to put more emphasis on the differences between the wealth of the characters we're watching and that of our own. We are, after all, talking about families with enough money to own entire planets. But Dune is also a narrative that's set against the terror-inducing scale of the cosmos. The Dune that I envisioned in my head was very much one where humanity's hubris was dwarfed by the cosmic realm in which they operate. It's impossible to grasp the meaning behind the narrative of Dune if humanity's actions aren't juxtaposed against the emptiness of the cosmos in which they're conducting their politics. Setting the events of the story against the backdrop of the vast expanse of nothingness in which we all dwell helps to keep the perspective grounded, reminding us that all the ambitions of these powerful individuals are there railing in futility against their own insignificance. And yet the film, to my knowledge, had only three shots which even showed the blackness of space, choosing instead to focus on its characters' lived experiences planetside. This is great for an action film that's grounded in a tangible reality, but it fails to capture the cosmic backdrop against which all the actions of the story are supposed to be set. Dune is also a very existential book. Hearing the comparisons to 2001 A Space Odyssey, I was really looking forward to the vision sequences, which I imagined building off of the trend of psychedelic effects that have had something of a return to form recently since their disappearance from the films of the 60s and 70s. Instead, the film opted for a minimalist approach to Paul's visions that worked in the filmic language Villeneuve chose, but at best failed to showcase the depth of mind that Herbert explores in the novels, and at worst, caused confusion in many viewers who didn't understand the meaning behind the subliminal flashes occurring throughout the film. There are great sequences in the book that describe in depth the inner workings of Paul's mind as he delves deeper and deeper into his own consciousness through his genetic gifts and the gift of spice. It was as though he existed within a globe with avenues radiating away in all directions, yet this only approximated the sensation. 
he remembered once seeing a gauze kerchief blowing in the wind, and now he sensed the future as though it twisted across some surface as undulant and impermanent as that of the wind-blown kerchief. He had to hold on to his awareness of the present. He felt for the first time the massive steadiness of time's movement. Everywhere complicated by shifting currents, waves, surges and countersurges, like surf against rocky cliffs. It gave him a new understanding of his prescience, and he saw the source of blind time, the source of error in it, with an immediate sensation of fear. Oddly enough, the much maligned David Lynch adaptation of Dune is more faithful to the novel in showing the disturbing inner truths for which Paul reaches. Now, because Villeneuve's movie was split into two parts, Paul's great moment of awakening has yet to happen. Part 2 will see Paul undertake the Water of Life ceremony as part of his initiation into the Fremen, and I hope that the few flickers of awareness we see in Part 1 are greatly expanded into something akin to Herbert's descriptions from the books. It's worth noting here that when I first read Dune, almost two decades ago, it was during a time in my life when my family would take annual trips to spend a week on a houseboat on Lake Powell. I made it a routine to always revisit the Dune series during these trips, climbing into my bunk with a clip fan blowing directly onto my face as I read about the Fremen and their culture's necessary conservation of water. The desert is something that's known to me, from growing up in the high deserts of Arizona to walking the canyons of Lake Powell with a single water bottle, moving from the shade of one boulder to another, trying carefully to manage my exertion so I did not spend too long burning in the sun. It's something I felt when I visited Wadi Rum, the location where Dune was filmed, and felt the deep time history written on the wind-etched walls formed by the movements of an ancient ocean. And this feeling, this combined sense of deep mysticism and arid oppression, was sadly missing from the desert I saw in the film. It's something that I know was felt by the actors, as some of them expressed in their own words the unique feelings imparted by this historic corner of the world. I've never seen a desert like that. I've never, I'm a rock climber. I've never seen rock like that. Beautiful. Peaceful, quiet, ominous. It feels like there's very much a spirituality that exists there. But Bill Neuve, a director who has had far better success capturing the snow-darkened depression of his winters in Canada, couldn't quite seem to translate this feel of the desert to the screen. Something about the movie felt too cool, temperature-wise. There's lots of sand and dust, and he certainly captured that omnipresent element perfectly. But there's only one shot that shows a character sweating. And seriously, no one in the film ever got a sunburn. It's odd to me that the two previous adaptations did a better job of capturing the heat of the desert and the feeling of skin burning and then cracking away from too much sun exposure. Naturally, much of the runtime of the film takes place at night, when characters conduct most of their activity to avoid the oppression of the day. But it's disappointing to have a film about the oppression of the desert capture so little of that tangible reality. I also took some issue with the film's portrayal of the city of Arakeen, which is supposed to be a bustling population center. The angular architecture was really cool, and some thought was clearly put into what a city would look like on a planet where deadly sandstorms are commonplace. But when the Harkonnen forces arrive and start bombarding the city, I didn't have any sense of the tragedy that was supposed to be because the city never felt like a place occupied by people. In fact, the only Arakian residents we see are the handful of pilgrims who come to stick their hands through a grate and pray to the Lisan al-Gaib. For real, these are the only glimpses we ever get of the population of Arakian. Even the bustling markets that are so vividly portrayed in the sci-fi miniseries are just empty plazas seen amidst all the explosions as Duncan Idaho makes his escape from the city. Why didn't we ever get to see these spaces occupied and lived in? it would have made this moment so much more tragic. Both the David Lynch and the sci-fi miniseries did a better job of showing how the political rivalry between the Harkonnens and the Atreides became a tragedy for the people living around them. I did love the way the bull's head hanging over the Atreides and the statue of the charging bull were used to symbolize the impending doom of their family. This is the first time that symbolic element of the book has made its way on screen faithfully, 
and I was thrilled by how effective this was in capturing the tragic tone of the book. Mythology also plays a huge role in the story of Dune. As you can probably guess from my other content, I'm a huge fan of Joseph Campbell's interpretation of mythology, which builds on the works of Freud and Jung to show us that mythology is a representation not of the fantasies of a culture, but of the deep-rooted psychology we all hold as individuals. Mythology is a reflection of how we impose our minds over reality, how we shape the universe we live in according to the principles we wish to see around us. Belief shapes reality more than reality shapes belief. And it's the way that Paul, and in future stories, his children, deliberately twist and shape these mythologies that tell us something about how easy it is for people and their leaders to shape reality into the form they wish it to take. There is a direct mention of this early in the film. It's their name for Messiah. That means the Bene Gesserit has been at work here. Planting superstitions. Preparing the way, Paul. And we get some hints at the mythology of Arrakis through its art and the rituals of its Fremen. But the important role this plays in the story as a whole has yet to be highlighted. One thing I do want to spend another moment talking about is the sound design. I saw the film twice in IMAX, and three times in a regular theater. Most noticeable was that in regular theaters, the sound of the last gun firing was almost inaudible at times. Whereas the higher range of IMAX speakers made it sound as if the walls of the theater were screaming. While we're on the topic of audio, I was really hesitant about how the creators would choose to portray the voice. In previous adaptations, the actor's speech was modified to carry more ominous, processed tones. Come, Vivian. If you know what's good for you, you'll do as I say. Which was not how Frank Herbert had intended voice to work. We do it all the time. Of course we do. <laughs> and it's amazing to me that anybody could even begin to question this. We're saying that if you know the individual well enough. Merely by the way you cast your voice, by the words you select, you can control him. Now, if you can do it in a gross way, obviously, with refinement, you can do it in much more subtle fashion. So, going into this movie, I was really hoping they wouldn't use the processed speech patterns from previous adaptations, and was worried when I saw something similar in a later trailer released for the film. But I'm happy to say that the stylized approach used doesn't make it seem as if the actors are speaking with inhuman vocals, but instead places you inside the head of someone on whom the voice is being used. In fact, the first time we hear voice used, in the second scene of the film, the audio actually cuts away entirely as Paul is speaking, and then reverberates back a second later. Give me the water. Showing us that what we're hearing is how the voice would register within our own minds. As great as the film's soundtrack was, I thought it was a little overused. There were many sequences that would have been vastly improved by removing the music. I'm thinking namely of the sequence where Paul and Jessica stumble into drum sand, while trying to avoid a prowling worm. Instead of giving us music to ratchet up the tension, run! it would have been great to borrow a technique from war films and let the sound serve as the only audio backdrop putting us more fully in the real intensity of that moment. One of my favorite sequences from the book and previous adaptations is this same moment when Paul and Jessica are hunted by the worm and it tracks them to a rock outcropping where they narrowly avoid its clutches, while getting an up-close glimpse at the internal workings of this creature that is, in many ways, more of a biological mechanism than an animal. The spice. Do you smell it? Yes! In Villeneuve's version, the worm just hovers over Paul, and we hear the workings of its internal engine as a slight thrumming. This is a great hint at its inner workings for those who have read the book, but in other adaptations, the mechanisms driving the worm's biology are more apparent. In the sci-fi miniseries, this moment was used to show the gullet of the worm opening, allowing us to literally see the great fires burning within Shai Halud. And 
hinting further at the connection between the worms and the spice that serves as a driving mystery behind the first few books in the series. Did you smell it? Cinnamon smell. Spice. The religious awe imparted by Shai Halut is instead left to the wordless moments in the desert, when we can see the presence the old man of the desert has simply in his passing. Kynes gives a brief soliloquy to Shai Halud before she dies. I serve only one master. His name is Shai Halud. Which is also worth pointing out because it changes the meaning of the character's death. In this rendition, she gets a last moment of victory before she goes to her god. But in the book, Kynes' death is intended to show the indifference of nature to the wishes of human beings. I Continuing that theme of human insignificance. In fact, this scene and the Gom Jabbar are the two defining moments of the original book, where Frank Herbert's intentions shine through and highlight some of what he's trying to say. As great as Kynes' death was in the film, I thought it lessened the presence of Herbert's message, one that remained intact in the miniseries. A couple more small details I want to point out. Dune is, of course, an expansive universe. With over 35,000 years of fictional history told across six books, there's a lot of source material to draw from, and Villeneuve and company do so with a commitment to detail that is inspiring. When the original Dune series was written, cell phones had yet to be invented, so Herbert, in the final book in his saga, created a device which served a similar purpose, known as an ear sea, what I imagine is short for earcom. Its description was different in the book, but it was cool to see this little technological device make its way into the film. Dune was also written at a time when genetic engineering was entering the mainstream conversation. And for a story in part about the horrors technology can inflict on its inventors, the Tleilaxu race was created to show what might happen to a human society if it came to fully embrace genetic tampering as a way of life. The Tleilaxu have an increasingly important role as Dune's narrative progresses, going so far as to be teased in the final two books as the big bad threat that had been lurking under the surface of the narrative from the very beginning. Unfortunately, Herbert wasn't able to follow up on this thread before he died and his son decided to take the narrative in a different direction. Nevertheless, Villeneuve's film has already established their shadowy presence in the form of one of their genetic abominations, purchased by the Harkonnens as some sort of pet, in-house spy, and perhaps worse. For a narrative that tells its important beats through small details, it was nice to see the Tleilaxu have some presence, even if they themselves did not make an appearance. Okay, and last complaint here. It's been said before, but it needs to be said again. Gurney Halleck never plays the Balisset. This may feel like a really trite thing to have on a list of complaints about the film, but when you have a scene of Paul asking him to sing this a song instead, which you've never established that he's a musician, that just makes Paul's comment come across as weird. It's rude. It's not a matter of fidelity, but writing. Also, I just really wanted to be serenaded by Gurney's tunes. What more can I say? But, all in all, I feel incredibly fortunate that this is the adaptation we got, blessed to have Denis Villeneuve behind the wheel, and miserably impatient, because I just want more. Alright, that's all from me for now. I've got a few new videos in the works. First will likely be another World Showcase video, introducing viewers to another fictional universe that I love and hold dear. And then I'm really looking forward to getting more Hero's Journey analysis videos out. I've got a lot of fun ideas for different films I can break down, some of which might be a little surprising. And I'm just really looking forward to taking the channel's content in a direction that allows me to have more fun and, hopefully, as a result, create more enjoyable content for you guys to watch. I have a lot more that I want to say, as far as I'm concerned, we're still establishing the foundational material for everything that I want to talk about in the future. So, I'm very appreciative that you all continue to watch, engage in the comments, and share this content with anyone else who might be interested. 
As always, these videos actually take a lot of personal resources for me to produce, so if you're interested in offsetting some of the financial costs of this channel, Offscreen has a Patreon page where you can support the creation of future videos for as low as $1 per video. Not only that, but we've got a pretty cool Discord community where I'm active every day talking about the latest film releases or chatting with community members as I'm working on the newest video. I'd love to have more voices in there to talk about games, movies, pop culture, and mythology. So, if that sounds like something you're interested in, head on over to this link. Otherwise, I'm gonna stop babbling right now and get back to work on the script for my next video. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. We'll see you in the next video, and, as always, may thy knife chip and shatter.